Okay, Jacob, we are live. Great. Um, well, thank you for joining us uh, on this course development prize in architecture, climate change and society session. Um, uh, logistics first, all uh, attendees are muted. You can use the question and answer feature to submit questions and vote them up or down uh, for the discussion that will follow the presentations. And all conference registrants will have access to a recording of this session um, on the platform soon. So uh, I'm Jacob Moore. I'm the Associate Director of the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia GSAP. Um, and the Buell Center, uh, along with me, is Lucia Alice is the Director, and Jordan Steingart is Program Manager. I'm really grateful for their collaboration always. And I'm also grateful to Eric Ellis, Edwin Hernandez, and Michelle Sturgis at ACSA for all the work that they've done to make uh, this panel and conference um, possible. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen um, to, let's see, does that work? Oops, sorry. Let's see, can you see that? Yes, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, or it's not, okay, it's not full screen. No, it's not? Oh, there, now it is. Yeah, now it is. Oh gosh, okay. You know what, I think I screwed up on the, from the presentation mode here. Um, and I don't have my thing printed. I don't think we need, well, you can see these images really quick. <laughs> I'm gonna just read it. Actually, Jacob, it. just a second ago, it did work. So maybe you could just hit Yeah, the but then I couldn't actually, I couldn't actually uh, read my notes. I neglected cool. to do present presentation <laughs> mode. It's just these images. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm gonna, it stopped sharing now, right? So sorry about that. <clears throat> um, I'm joining you today from a campus on an island that lies within the ancestral homelands of the Lenin Lenape people. Uh, until about 1650, the Lenape managed the forests, marshes, animals, winds, floods, and paths of this place by stopping in as they navigated what is now called the Hudson River, seasonally staying in small encampments, growing food, perhaps also harvesting crops, hunting and fishing some animal species while conserving others, uh, periodically setting fires to control growth and generally um, maintaining a resource ecology that stretched all along the Atlantic coast uh, from what is now Western Connecticut to Delaware and including most of New Jersey and Southern New York. By the end of the 17th century, the Lenny Lenape had largely been driven out of their homelands. In the centuries since, their communities have been decimated, their humanity denied and their descendants dispersed. In the centuries to come, the European settler power that was responsible for this erasure and diaspora would continue to rely overwhelmingly on systems of control, of bodies, of resources, of information, and of land. And it is these profit-driven systems, industrialized development that has undergirded the shift into an uh, Anthropocene still dominated by white supremacy and other forms of enforced sociocultural inequality. But resistance to these forces, also long present, persists today. And it is this struggle, together with architecture's relation to it, that this prize and the panel gathered here today intends to address under the title Architecture, Climate Change, and Society. Uh, the Buell Center, a research center housed within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University, began issuing this prize uh, in 2020. And I'm just going to put a couple links in the chat um, if they work. Um, in 2020, in collaboration with the ACSA, um, as we noticed that the all too typically uh, quote unquote solutions oriented uh, approaches to climate change and architectural education seem to come at the exclusion or at the expense of other perhaps more critical humanities based approaches, approaches that didn't take for granted that it was always the same assumed quote unquote problem needing to be solved. Within the discipline itself, especially by 2020, it has become painfully clear that a lack of racial, gender, and socioeconomic diversity, among other forms, inherited from and reproduced by the aforementioned European settler power that remains dominant, is a challenge inextricably linked with the work of design and building that lies ahead. And these challenges in and of society are themselves inextricably linked to the menace of climate change. Thankfully, many activists, artists, and scholars have been leading the way in recent years 
by showing that to respond in a meaningful way to each of these challenges must mean responding to all of them together. The Green New Deal or an extension of it that we at the Buell Center have taken to understanding as uh, what we're calling green reconstruction uh, is one such rubric among others. And so in the spirit of curricular change as part and parcel of societal change, uh, I'm really excited that we'll be able to hear today from this year's winners of the Course Development Prize in Architecture, Climate Change and Society. Uh, on behalf of the Buell Center Advisory Board to whom we're very grateful uh, for their service in selecting this and previous year's winners and honorable mentions. I want to express how impressed and inspired we've been by the number, range and quality of applications from across the staggering diversity of professional programs included in the ACSA's network. They come from private and public, though notably more um, public institutions, uh, large and small, inside and outside the borders of the United States. And this year's winners are wonderfully representative of this meaningful heterogeneity, as well as, as of its power, uh, potential, excuse me, for impact in all corners of the discipline and its curricula. So in the interest of reserving as much time for discussion as we can, um, this year's amazing winners will uh, introduce themselves in their presentations uh, as they like, and also their bios included on the conference platform. Um, uh, and we can also discuss, uh, you know, institutional and uh, professional backgrounds on the Q and A. So uh, I'm now going to hand it off to them, uh, and we'll look at presentations that have been uh, uh, organized on video, and we'll reconvene after the presentations for a discussion. So as we jump into that, I just want to remind you that uh, you are already able to, and throughout the the presentation that you're that we all watch together, you can input questions and everybody can uh, can you know click on the ones that they they hope to hear most answered because I imagine that the Q and A will be uh, uh, that we have more questions than we have time. So um, the more collaborative collaborative we can be about that, the better. So I really appreciate everyone um, being here, and we'll jump into the to the presentations and see each other at the Q and A. Good afternoon. My name is Nia Malou. I'm an architect and educator teaching at Howard University. This is my cross prize development uh, award, environmental justice, health plus decarbonization. This particular course puts climate change in society in the middle of our discussion and how do we create a better building better design so that we can combat climate change and the changing aspects of our society. Climate is changing. Why aren't we changing? Why isn't our curriculum changing? So this is an attempt to change architectural curriculum and create better designers for the society. Climate change is the biggest global injustice. Because of climate change, we have numerous disasters happening from wildfires to flood and disasters. Black communities bear a disproportionate burden of harmful impacts of continued fossil fuel use. There's a lot of evidence, research, and this particular course addresses and how do we design buildings for all communities. Health, which is the occupant health, which is the most important architectural difference we can make is addressed in here. Health cannot be looked at independently. It has to be looked in conjunction with environment and animal and as one health because we are all related in a very symbiotic relationship. Economy, the cost of not doing is gonna cost a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of poverty and not doing is going to destroy our current economy. The social cost of carbon, the social cost of fossil fuels is pretty evident everywhere with the new disasters we face, new climate fires we face, new destruction we face in today's society. 
So to stop climate change, we have to have better designers. To do that, our education and our curriculum should be incarnate from there. We can't make the trip to Washington for the climate change rally, but we can do our part from here. So this is my part as an educator, as an architect towards that development. I start with my most uh, beloved uh, saying, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela is my mentor and this saying, I carry it in my heart every day when I teach my students. This particular course is meant to do that. Can we change the future of architecture? Can we change the future and offer designers by teaching them how to design with environmental justice as a centerpiece of architecture and buildings? The process is simple in a, in a diagrammatic way. It's a four step process. You start with a typical building, you go to an efficient building, and then you add healthy materials. And then building materials have carbon in it. And how do we remove the carbon so we can save the planet? Again, the discussion starts and revolves around environmental justice. The reason is we need a quality of light. We need fair treatment. And as architects, planners who create the community, as designers who live in this community, we need to make the change what we want to see. So the first step as a designer for a building in this course will be taught is how to make it building and most more energy efficient. We're going to use architectural strategies for efficient design from better insulation. We're going to teach students how to do modeling. We're going to teach students how to do exterior shading, efficient light, and how to make your site your friend. Then we're going to teach the next overlay is the health. How do we pick better building materials to make our buildings much more efficient? Then we're going to add the solar, the geothermal, and any renewable which is available in the context with the electric buildings to create a better design for the community. All of this discussion with the centralized theme, am I providing justice for all? And the last step in this process would be building decarbonization. Carbon is a big imprint in our every single building construction everything we do has carbon in it but buildings can be better in carbon so as a designer what is the impact i can have as a designer what is the impact my students can have in the discussion of carbon so the carbon emission the impact is if i'm an average american who doesn't you know just goes about his life then i have an impact of 1200 metric tons of carbon dioxide. But if I'm a building designer, I can impact almost 1.15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. How is that? If I, in my career of 45 years, in my students' career of 45 years, if they design three buildings per year, and the math works out to be 1.15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, that is equivalent to 35,000 electric cars. The embodied carbon has two aspects to it. One is the operational carbon and the embodied carbon of materials. The operational carbon can be reduced in a lifetime by having more high efficient and high performance building. The students will be taught in how to do this. The students will also engage in activities which teach them how to reduce the material impact of embodied carbon. And then the carbon which is present in the building itself. How do we, what do we do about it? Can we do carbon offsets? The first carbon offset, which is most prevalent is biosextration. Do we put plants trees? Can we have more renewable energy? Or can we do community-based carbon offset? All of these discussions will be made in the class to help the student understand that there is not one solution which fits all, 
and it needs to be discussed. It needs to be put in the center scape with environmental justice in the middle of it. So this particular course makes the student a leader in sustainability and puts the dis discussion of sustainability, climate change in the center of education, in the center of architecture, in the center of all of us. Thank you to Harvard University. Thank you to Buell Center and ACSA for helping me with this course. And thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeanette Kim. I'm an assistant professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, where I co-direct a research lab called the Urban Works Agency. Um, special thanks to the Buell Center for recognizing this work. We're really thrilled to be part of such a compelling and powerful group of initiatives. Um, today, my colleagues Brendan Levitt, James Graham, and I are going to present a cluster of courses planned for this fall called Decommodifying Ownership from Extraction to Regeneration. The three of us came together to work across curricular tracks of um, design, building technology, and history theory. Our goal is not just to bridge across familiar characterizations of each, as for example, um, investigations in form making, performance optimization, and critical research practices. In addition, we hope to find inventive methods um, by which each subfield can depict resources like energy, water, materials, nutrients, labor, and knowledge as sites of both extraction and regeneration. So in this way, we hope to open up what the Buell Center Development Prize calls the sociocultural and eco-political dimensions of the climate crisis, um, and thus find more speculative techniques for architects. My design studio does this by exploring how architects shape property um, and the kind of resources and cultural life associated with it. The studio is called Property in Crisis, and this will be its third iteration, um, but arranged within this course cluster for the first time. From the Jeffersonian grid to the single family home, the commodification of land as property has especially excluded communities of color from forging wealth and belonging. But many of the underlying logics of property, such as the commons, liability, maintenance, and even profit, can be altered towards more inclusive ends. So community land trusts, for example, can take land off of the speculative market, or indigenous use rights can support the collective maintenance of land. In light of the movement generation's definition of extractive and regenerative economies, um, this studio hopes that property can proliferate resources, not extract them. So we'll begin the semester by making um, what we call follow the money diagrams, which track the flow of different kinds of currencies in relationship to land. And then next we'll design scenarios in which alternate property arrangements can take hold. And these images that I'm showing come from previous iterations of the studio. And then as the focus of their design work, um, and here again, as you can imagine, I'm showing um, professional work um, by other architects, um, but as the focus of their design work for the remainder of the semester, students will then study an architectural element in relationship to property. So elements in this case could include things like ground, foliage, foundations, walls, roof, floors, roofs, furniture, and fixtures. Um, so for example, we'll see how water could erode away lot, lot lines or how ground plane could be doubled, or we'll see how walls could kind of open up to include different users or maybe change over time to allow multiple owners to coexist. Um, and then lastly, we'll work in teams to combine these elements. Um, so, you know, I think although private property has for so long um, de been dependent on a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the boundaries of a parcel and the rights and responsibilities of a landowner, we will look for unexpected misalignments across these elements to reshape property boundaries.
Thank you, Jeanette. Um, my name is Brendan Levitt. I'm an associate professor and building technology coordinator at CCA. And as part of the Decommodifying Ownership Initiative, I've proposed to teach an advanced building technology seminar that explores ways that students can incorporate into their studio projects notions of a regenerative and decommodified economy. We'll examine how the collective commons is affected by externalized costs intrinsic to our existing carbon-based economy. And we'll also imagine future alternatives that foreground the challenges, uncertainties, and opportunities of a more equitable built environment. Students will test their conceptual ideas with pragmatic solutions based on first principle calculations and simulations at the scale of the grid, the neighborhood, the building and the room. And students will test their, no. Um, students are gonna be working on um, a, a combination of different modes of representation. The examples that I'm showing here are called from a variety of seminars and workshops that I've taught. They're intended to illustrate a much broader methodolo methodology Um, we're going to use a generative framework for design rather than a traditional problem solution approach that's common to engineering practice. And in the process, the, um, we'll be reconceiving how energy and matter can function as closed loop systems, continuous environmental flows, in which the architecture is not the end result, but part of a larger cycle over time and space. Students will experiment with both analytical and phenomenological notions of building performance, reconceiving the building's relationship to climate, landscape, and habitat. All the while, quantitative analysis will alternate with speculative explorations based on responses to theoretical texts, art, art films, and environmental artists' work. Both of these right brain and left brain modes will inform analysis and redesign of the, stu the student's studio projects. And the class is designed to build intuition and test perspective scenarios using simulation tools in a fast and iterative fashion. Uh, while the goal of discovering ways that regenerative performance can mitigate climate change um, while creating comfort and delight. I'll hand it over to James. Okay, great. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I'm James Graham, and I teach history and theory here at CCA, where I also co-direct uh, HTX, the History Theory Experiments Lab. So my component of the decommodifying ownership uh, cluster is a seminar titled Spaces of Extraction, which aims to expand some of these conversations um, uh, around land, property, resource, uh, and climate change into the past. Um, so this course looks at the extractive landscapes of California from the late 18th century to the present with a particular focus on settler colonialism, electrification, resource extraction, and the financialization of property relations. California has long been understood as, as a resource of sorts, whether in terms of the extractive landscapes of the missions, uh, the gold rush, the California petroleum boom, and American empire in the Pacific, or the extreme housing market uh, of today. So this class is meant to situate our work as architects within the economies of extraction that have driven climate change, the buildings, infrastructures, logistical networks, uh, and the landscapes really of fossil capitalism. But we're also going to be looking uh, sort of beyond the building, um, uh, uh, attending to the connections between the fields of architecture, geology, oops, um, political economy, law, and ecological thought. So the first month of the class is going to be focused on developing uh, group presentations around some of the 
particular themes uh, that might be of interest uh, to the studio, particularly around the uh, dispossession of indigenous lands, the creation of infrastructural networks across California, uh, the different ideas about extractable resources found um, in California over the centuries, and the translation of land into property. And so the intention is that we'll then have a sort of mini symposium with the studio to help bring some of that historical thinking um, into uh, uh, the design side of things. And after the group work uh, that will be the focus of the first uh, part of the semester, students will then undertake individual research on a topic of their own choosing. Past student topics have ranged from highway construction, logging practices, stone walls, uh, the migrant labor uh, that goes into constructing them, to problems of military surplus, um, oops, military surplus, uh, nuclear waste containment, extractive office landscapes, and the ecological cost of cryptocurrency, for example. So the goal of the semester is really to draw out some of the imperial and extractive systems that architecture and our own location really here in California has historically uh, sat within how climate and housing uh, sit alongside things like zoning laws, building codes, labor struggles, geology, atmospheric data, racial capitalism, and financial globalization, and especially how, how the globe and the land have come to be seen through the managerial logics of resource. Uh, but the seminar also insists uh, on history's role in helping us as designers in undertaking uh, a reparative work here in the present. So to briefly uh, uh, conclude these three classes, this, this cluster of courses is an experiment in what might happen when we coordinate uh, more intensively across some of the various curricular streams of our school, how our various courses might offer new perspectives on shared questions relating to climate, uh, and how we might engage uh, with shared concerns and, in fact, uh, shared bibliography. And perhaps it might even be something like a testing ground for ways to make climate change and equity uh, still more present and more fundamental within our curricular core. And as part of our uh, collaboration, we've created a series of shared sessions, as well as exchanges and sort of handoffs between these three courses to place all of these various uh, tools for analysis and design into dialogue. So we're excited to see how it all shakes out, and we'll be looking forward to the conversation with our fellow panelists. Thank you. Hello. Wes Aziz and Lindsay Crook, and we're delighted to share Monopoly Dollar with you today. Thank you to the ACSA and Columbia University's Temple Hoyne Buell Center for supporting our course proposal and organizing this event. I'm a visiting assistant professor of architecture at the University of Colorado, Denver, CU Denver, and Lindsay is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, or UWM. We were both 2020 to 2021 Fitzhugh Scott Fellows at UWM, and we found that our research areas overlap as we both investigate industrial ecologies, nefarious land use strategies, and precarious environmental practices across America. So we decided to examine Wisconsin together, and we soon discovered that the most pervasive, invasive, and ubiquitous force shaping the state is actually Dollar General. It's the largest and most influential of the dollar store triumvirate, family dollar, dollar tree, and dollar general. As we research a cross-section of the 18,000 plus Dollar General stores and distribution centers across the country and wrote Monopoly Dollar, we wanted to work with students to see firsthand how the retail empire affects large-scale commercial practices and mom-and-pop corner shops, small-scale domestic realities. As we come to incorporate the dollar store research into daily conversations with colleagues, friends, and family, uh, often to a reception of crickets or awkward silences. We've learned the importance of really answering why, uh, why we think Dollar General is a useful tool or lens for studying the built environment. So we're gonna try to provide some context here today. So we're aware that the dollar store is likely not a typology that draws people into the profession of architecture as they tend to be these off the shelf structures which aren't so awe inspiring. But it's worth noting that at in 
in 2022, nearly one in three new stores opening in the US is a dollar store. Uh, and according to a report by CoreSight Research, dollar stores accounted for one third of all retail openings last year in America. Two thirds of those are owned and operated by Dollar General, which is the largest small box retailer. So we're really seeing an unprecedented proliferation of the dollar store economy. While part of Dollar General's expansion model has long been to move into communities and areas where Walmart and other big box grocers wouldn't, which gives at least one food and retail option to residents of those communities, there is significant debate about whether this rapid growth is having a net positive impact on regions considered to be food deserts. Dollar General ex executives tout the positive impacts their presence can have on a community, providing that one-stop shop to a variety of affordable goods but they strategically maintain their stores in the small box category under 10,000 square feet to avoid more stringent zoning and permitting rules and in turn limiting the number of food options. The company touts investment in literacy programs through their eponymous literacy foundation as well as job creation, but they have a troubling track record of labor force treatment as in this case that made its way to the Supreme Court in 2016, as well as a recently squashed unionization effort from a store in Connecticut. So this inquiry into Dollar General really demands a tremendous scalar nimbleness and allows us to relate the scale of the domestic object up to the scale of a global network. We're trying to figure out where small box architecture, which is rapidly and inconspicuously taking over the built environment without much regard for its environmental impact, trying to figure out where that fits into this picture. And a way that we're trying to do this is by running an interdisciplinary vertical research and design studio that operates at both UWM and CU Denver and uses a Dollar General corporation to examine the country's environmental, economic and racial fault lines and in turn highlight this understudied vernacular typology as a weapon of discourse and agent of climate activism. So the course will ask students to reimagine the architectural canon beyond the 1% of LEED certified star architect buildings and instead use a local and familiar as catalysts for creating new climate regimes. And as they trisect the country, the two comparable design programs working in tandem allow students to observe a nation as a whole and develop systems for surveying a cross section of Dollar General enterprises that move from the provincial to the cosmopolitan. Students will conduct extensive primary research in the form of travel, interviews and documentation, product testing, and also by studying permitting applications and legal documents pertaining to the organization. With the support of a Dollar General Literacy Foundation grant, students will interrogate the Dollar General machine from its copy and paste building design and tactical anti-permitting strategies that enable it to proliferate and undercut its competitors to the way that it affects large-scale ag agricultural practices and small-scale domestic realities. And they will use their findings to test the environmental consequences of making a series of small measured disruptions in the dollar general system. And finally, they will compile their speculative proposals into a book and paired exhibition that will be comp comprehensible to people outside of architecture and outside of the academy. The book will retail in the 18,000 plus Dollar General stores and the exhibition, Dollar General Futures, will involve designing and producing a panoply of climate responsive objects for sale in a future Dollar General store. So since being granted the course prize and in preparation for the studio we're proposing and will teach next year, Sarah and I have been developing the research in a number of capacities and we'd like to share some of that with you today. So for one, we're teaching a research seminar at UWM as a kind of generator ahead of the studio course next year. The course has been divided up into five scalar investigations that involve both documenting things as they are, as well as projecting alternative futures for the dollar store economy. So students started at the smallest scale, in this case, the object documenting the kind of goods sold at Dollar General. And then they moved into the planogram or the organizing, marketing, and displaying of those objects. We then leaped to architecture, speculating about building systems and re-injecting the vast amounts of material waste that the corporation produces and putting that back into the building technology. And finally, they've expanded reading the country, to reading the country as a whole and studying the various types of networks that Dollar General plugs into. So anything from 
labor to law, agriculture, economics, philanthropy, transportation, and, and so on. So in this case, this map plots dollar general salaries by state relative to average salaries for those roles around the country, along with excerpts uh, from uh, employees reflecting on their time working for the company. Uh, we will get to global networks, it just hasn't happened yet. The second permutation of the project is titled Burn After Buying, which asks Dollar General to use its geographic scope and influence to provide an antidote to irreversible environmental decline, to which it certainly contributes. The idea is to move the company into the domestic realm, into communities prone to or affected by catastrophic climate events, and ask it to take the needs of its users and their landscapes into its scope of service. The first iteration is proposed for Denver, Colorado at a site adjacent to the 2021 Colorado wildfires. So the makeshift Dollar General store will stock objects designed to help manage or mitigate the effects of a climate catastrophe. And ideally this model, which is a kind of domestic mutual aid network, has the potential to be similar to the ready-made small box building insofar as it forms a decentralized and accessible network that is scalable and replicable in other cities, states, and regions. And finally, a proposal we're working on for Wisconsin that melds public art and scholarship to create accessible educational opportunities for land literacy in the state. Sand Dollar operates as a discursive tool in the landscape by decontextualizing and defamiliarizing a recognizable retail entity. In the context of Sauk County, Wisconsin, we're looking at the expanding sand fracking industry that's tearing up farm and forest land to create to source construction grade silica sand used in high performance building materials and glass. In the construction of this installation with its deliberately porous facade and chipped brick will offer a mound of this precious material a way to drift freely uh, back to the Wisconsin landscape from which it came. And in conclusion, the hold that the industry leader Dollar General has in the American landscape, society and culture is profound and as we can see growing exponentially. All of the items that it sells are manufactured in villages across the Xinjiang province in China and distributed through the future market, which is also known as Commodity City. It's the largest wholesale market in the entire world. So with support from the ACSA and the Temple Hong Buell Center, we're starting to ask new questions, ones around invasiveness and authenticity in America. What does it mean that American aesthetics and domestic rituals are imported from China? And how do we grapple with the inherent contradictions that Dollar General presents us? While the company accelerates environmental decline through global shipping emissions, monoculture, agriculture, and selling overpackaged throwaway products, it also happens to stock a panoply of affordable shelf stable foods and bug out bag essentials for surviving a climate catastrophe. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to take the time to unpack these questions. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my course. My name is Brittany Edding. I'm an assistant professor of architecture at Rice University and co-founder of the Research and Design Collaborative Home Office. Today, I'll be presenting my studio, Deep Geologies, Material Encounters in Texas, which was one of the recipients of the 2022 Course Development Prize in Architecture, Climate Change, and Society. This spring, I was actually able to teach a version of the course here at Rice Architecture, so I will be also showing some preliminary research and design work from the senior level undergraduate studio. Geology is a conception of the planet's surface as thick, resource rich, and energy latent, forming slowly in what John McPhee has described as the deep time of the Earth. This terrestrial crust is composed of dense layers of rock, hot pyroclastic flows, igneous intrusions, and tectonic plates slipping and grinding along fault lines. Laced within these shifting rocks, the crust also contains the raw materials and carbon fuels of the technosphere, bands of iron ore, veins of mineral deposits, seams of coal, and vast fields of oil. Our everyday worlds are sourced from these geologies, fracking, cracking, mining, drilling, processing, and burning, feeding a supply chain essential to the production and powering of the built environment. The materials themselves have specific qualities and attitudes, enforcing structures of power and metabolizing territories through their spatial patterns. Converted into the materiality of empire and the immaterial of energy, these resources produce a complex infrastructure of capital, energy, and heat. Yet while these geologies constitute the substructure of carbon modernity, determining its urban scales, circulatory flows, and organizational forms, they also devastate landscapes, bodies, and climates. 
As Andreas Malm writes, the slow inertial violence of carbon accumulation implicates the geological and our relationship with the climate of the past, the present, and the future. The duration of broader terrestrial cycles, such as the carbon cycle, water cycle, and nitrogen cycle, not only illustrate how, ge how the geological is deeply entangled with all aspects of the climate, from the atmosphere to the biosphere to the cryosphere, but also opens up a critical space for architecture to reassess its own material practices. Deploying spatial and landscape tactics to intercede in these extractive processes, this studio seeks to trouble the persistence and durability of the hydrocarbon toward a deeper conception of geology, a planetary assemblage of landscapes, ecologies, organisms, technologies, and atmospheres. Learning from Anna Singh's concept of the liveliness of materials, deep geologies looks to the entanglement of energy industries and transnational economies, geographies of extraction, and struggles for sovereignty to imagine new architectures for terrestrial care. Working in the context of Texas, students will intercede in sites of material extraction, processing, and movement through architectural landscape interventions. Through their spatial forms, relationship to territories, and ecological agendas, projects will reimagine how architecture can participate in a just transition to a post-carbon future. Exploring the potential for hybrid thinking within material extraction, deep geologies asks how the built world can more radically engage with agendas for post-extractive programming, from decommissioning and rewilding to environmental justice and repair. So for this first exercise, geology and that material, students will begin the studio by investigating and extracting material used in the built environment, examining, examining its geological qualities, compositions, modes of extraction and processing, architectural assemblies and product cycles. Students will assemble a series of physical artifacts that document the materials, geophysical and architectural conditions, including drawings of building materials, fragments of the material, product specifications and processing methods. Some of the texts that we read in this section or that we will read include Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis, Jane Hutton's Reciprocal Landscape, Stories and Material Movements, and we also watched the 2015 film Topophilia. The deliverables of this first exercise is to assemble three artifacts to explore material properties, manufacturing processes, construction assemblies, and life cycles. Unfortunately, in this iteration of the course, due to COVID-19 restrictions, the first module of the studio was virtual. So this exercise was modified to produce a series of drawings instead of artifacts, but I hope to develop models in the next iteration of the studio. So shown here are two examples, of some of these drawings, which looked at the material processes involved in the extraction and manufacturing of steel, concrete, glass, plastic, stone, and gypsum. On the left here is an image of sand extraction for concrete. On the right is a drawing exploring the processes of oil refining and plastic production. For exercise two, geology and territory, uh, students ch will choose a Texas-based site of extraction or processing of a material used in the built environment and document the site's geological, territorial, and ecological conditions. In parallel to organizing field trips to sites, to local sites to document the landscape and meet with geological environmental experts in the area, students will also use virtual field work techniques such as um, GIS mapping, data gathering to construct digital models of the sites. Maps should explore the following questions. What are the, the relationships and movements between local geological conditions in Texas and global supply chains? How does the territory's resources relate to its forms of property, infrastructure, development, and governance? And what ecosystemic, atmospheric, and political effects do these processes of resource extraction and transportation cause? So in the second module, we read um, some of the texts that we read include uh, A. Laura Palmer's Or of the Whole, Exploring Sites of Material Extraction. Uh, Martin Arboleda's Planetary Mine, Territories of Extraction Under Lake Capitalism, and Catherine Yusuf's text, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. So the deliverables of the exercise um, are to represent a material landscape through its geological, infrastructural, and territorial conditions uh, by producing a series of maps. So this um, first set of maps shown here um, is of the Permian Basin in West Texas, uh, where Midland and Marfa is from. It's a vast oil field which produces more than 5 million barrels of oil per day. These two maps shown here compare the visible infrastructures of oil extraction with the invisible infrastructures of oil transportation, uh, locating active uh, on, the, on the left, locating active sites of oil extraction in the region in relationship to the network of underground oil and natural gas pipes shown on the right. So um, the student's current studio project is developing an infrastructure for plugging and cleaning up abandoned oil pumps, which are prone to leaking even after the oil well has been spent. In this second set of maps, the student was interested in the relationship between the extraction of hydroelectricity through dams and the delta ecologies that these same dams disrupt downriver. 
Shown here is the Rio Grande River along the Mexican-Texan border from the Amistad Reservoir up in the, shown in white in the upper left to the city of Brownsville on the Gulf of Mexico. The map on the right, um, excuse me, the map on the left compares the pre-existing course of the river and its delta in blue to engineered channels of water circulation in the city of Brownsville in white. So you can see the, the uh, loss of the natural delta flow. And then uh, the map on the right compares, excuse me, um, and then the map on the right shows the generation of um, hydroelectricity shown as a glow of white. So the student's current studio project is seeking to restore delta ecologies and water channels that have been negatively impacted by the damming of the reservoir. Um, these channels are called, known as resecas um, in the Brownsville region. Um, so for the third module, geology and repair, um, students move from research to design. Um, students will begin the design process by developing a charter for an institute of terrestrial care in Texas. Thinking through programs centered around climate care, uh, these institutional charters will serve as uh, the students' design briefs for the following exercise, outlining each of their project specific programs and scope. Charters uh, will propose research, civic, and pedagogical facilities for the communities and landscapes that are affected um, and seeking to engage in municipal, environmental, and activist agendas. Some of the questions um, that these charters will maybe put forth are how can the energy and material infrastructures of the built environment engage with projects of environmental justice and, and land rematriation? What material assemblies, sensibilities, and cultures offer an alternative to systems of extraction for designers? And how can architectural types, forms, landscapes, and systems produce programs for geological restoration, remediation, and repair from the scale of the building to the territory? So some of the text um, that we read include Maria de Bellicasa's Matters of Care, Holly Jean Buck's After Geoengineering, and Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, edited by Anna Singh, Nils Bubant, Elaine Gann, and Heather Ann Swanson from 2017. So students um, each wrote an institutional charter researching existing environmental policies and community agendas in their sites to begin developing programs for envir environmental repair. And so shown here is the Rosakas project um, in Brownsville, uh, putting forward a municipal policy that will seek to uh, restore these fragile ecologies. Um, and so uh, moving on to the actual um, design prompt, which is the bulk of the studio. Um, Students use their uh, charter exercise to propose architectural and landscape design strategies for an Institute of Terrestrial Care in Texas. The Institute um, would include public facing programs such as classrooms and galleries, research focused programs such as laboratories, test landscapes and field stations, as well as residencies for care workers. Um, some of the prompts or themes that the projects are taking on are proposing new ways that architecture can inhabit the world through the design of typological hybrids and alternative material assemblies, experiment with strategies for a post-extractive world such as industrial decommissioning, energy transitioning, ecological remediation, and carbon capturing, and also imagine how to repair and care for the land and its geological and ecological conditions. So to give you an idea about how the studio is developing, I'm going to show some progress images from projects uh, around midterm uh, in early March. Uh, this first project is interested in the network of limestone quarries along the Edwards Plateau in the Texas Hill Country. They have been reached, the students have been researching the relationship between the Edwards Aquifer and critical hydrological cycles in the region and are imagining new ways to reclaim and rewild abandoned quarries. The second project is researching the network of decommissioned uranium mines in southeastern Texas understanding methods of uranium tailing disposal and processes of monitoring to um, the radioactive material. So their project combines a landscape strategy of phytoremediation to withdraw the uranium from the ground and the water, um, combined with an architectural strategy that deploys a gradient of material thicknesses to create safe spaces for researchers to test and monitor areas around the uranium disposal sites. And finally, this last project is interested in the relationship between sand mining and fracking in the Permian Basin. So the student, this student has chosen the Kermit Sandhill Dunes, which have recently been sold to mining companies for sand extraction. The project is imagining a post-oil future, restoring the sand dunes with a series of fabric walls that capture sand particles blown along the Trans-Pecos Plateaus. And alongside this landscape strategy, they are also proposing to reoccupy the abandoned quarry infrastructures 
um, with environmental laboratories and research residencies. So thank you all for your attention in this presentation about my studio, Deep Geologies. I'm looking forward to discussing the studio outcomes and methodologies in this panel. Welcome to the Dean of Bowling Green State University and University of Toledo. We are the team will look and study urban islands in a legacy city named Toledo, Ohio, or also refer to the class city. My name is Andreas Lucio. I'm an architecture faculty and chair and deeply interested in urbanism and its impact both at suburban and urban sites. And I would like to introduce uh, Susheta Shetty, my colleague. Hi, I'm Sujata Shetty. I'm uh, a professor in the Department of Geography and Urban Planning at the University of Toledo. I'm trained as an architect and as an urban planner and also interested in um, the um, land use and social issues uh, that arise particularly in legacy cities. Hi, my name is Yang Huang. I teach architecture and urbanism at Bowling Green State University. As a new member of this community, I'm very excited to be able to join with Sujita and Andreas on this project. This proposed uh, research-based studio will focus on the intersection between such heat events and the structure of the city, both social, economic, and physical. The question we ask is, how can heat mitigation, architecture, and planning interventions further social equity? Our exploration aims to examine the emergent relationship between our daily experience and the urban condition, and to reintegrate the well-being of individuals with the design of healthy public space in the neighborhood-wide environments. Climate change has led to an increase in the length, severity, and frequency of heat waves. And one major contributor to prolonged high temperatures is urban heat islands. These are urban areas that are significantly warmer than their surroundings, chiefly because of concentrated heat that is emitted from the built environment, from vehicles, and from industrial land uses. In cities, impervious surfaces such as roads, sidewalks, parking lots, driveways, and roofs create these urban heat islands. Tree canopies can mitigate some of these effects, but nationwide, the number of trees in a neighborhood is related to the degree of segregation in a metropolitan area. As a result, urban heat islands are far more likely to be located in poor and minority neighborhoods as compared to affluent white neighborhoods. As my previous colleagues mentioned, Susheta Shetty and Yang Hang, that studying this urban uh, heat island effects is not only important for future city, but is even more severe for industrial city of US Midwest because they are deeply hurt by persistent population loss abandoned uh, uh, plots, change of economic structure, and radical and economic separation. Having this opportunity and uh, being selective this prize makes us really proud. And I want to say thank you to be uh, part of the team uh, to present this active climate change proposal. I'll say that um, Toledo is uh, somewhat representative of a number of cities in this part of the country. We have lost population over many decades now as industry left the region. Um, and so from a high of about 380 plus thousand people, we are now closer to about 270,000 people. So we are a city that is struggling with population decline and economic decline. One study we will focus on is, and then define neighborhoods and within the neighborhoods identify urban heat islands. And one case is here and 
uh, multi-complex family uh, uh, apartments, housing, built in the late 60s, 70s. And, but the interesting part is not only where they're located is, but the relationship to the urban East Highlands is extensive here in this case, you know. So we have a, a, a shopping mall here, it's a, a, a large a, a East Island, another parking lot here, another parking lot here, another parking lot here, another parking lot over here. And then within the housing complex, we have some uh, parking uh, uh, that generates uh, a lot of heat islands. And this is pretty typical of Toledo. If you look on the east of North 14, you see a subdivision, um, houses all in place, lots of trees, um, as compared to the multifamily housing here, which is surrounded by a lot of asphalt. And uh, a little bit to the west here, you can see again single family homes, but you can see a lot of abandonment. Um, and you see green spaces, but not as many trees to the far left of your screen. Within this context, uh, as we introduced this project, and we, like, we will introduce this to our students in fall of 22, we will have a joint studio and joint seminar, which we explore these topics. And hopefully we'll come up with some generative ideas and concepts to address and improve not only the urban living quality, but uh, also the social aspect and also the justice aspect. And so everybody has an equal opportunities to, to, uh, to work or live in, in the pleasant uh, neighborhood. You know, historically, we have uh, much more parking space than we really need for the city. Yes, and uh, the um, vacant, uh, vacancy and abandonment and these unused parking lots um, you see are overrepresented in our communities that are um, lower income and communities of color and that's largely because those are the neighborhoods in the city where more abandonment has occurred. Uh, and as a result of that you see this connection between uh, disadvantaged communities um, unused land, especially um, hard surfaces, and the impacts, environmental impacts of urban heat islands. And so our larger aim is to see whether by mitigating the impacts of, of uh, the, the negative impacts of the built environment on urban heat, whether we might be able to work towards creating a more just and equitable uh, urban environment. Interesting, uh, uh, one of these neighborhoods are uh, aligned with some parks and greens areas. Uh, although a more denser area on this area versus very few trees here. But, interest but the green areas in itself and just planting trees is, n is not, it's maybe a good step forward, but the grass itself is actually artificial, produced in greenhouse uh, to make a perfect green. Preferable, it should be a natural green with, with water and insect addressing uh, our environment to live. So this uh, distinct species uh, and honeys, like urban honeys could be coming back in these areas and other insect will become and that will create a more um, have environmental quality of life for people living there. So we're looking really at both the physical aspects of these green spaces, like increasing biodiversity or different ways in which to make these green spaces richer and more natural, but also looking at where they're located and how they might help uh, people who live in those neighborhoods. So it's looking at both the physical and the social organization that is required to reduce the negative impacts of urban heat islands in our city.
Great. I think, yeah, if everybody can jump back on, uh, really appreciate all the work that went into uh, preparing for these courses and putting those presentations together. Um, I wanna remind everybody uh, here in the um, session that you can add questions um, to uh, the little Q&A feature. Um, so please feel free to do that. We have about 30 minutes um, to talk about all these um, really amazing and um, in some ways connected uh, course proposals. Um, uh, so I wanna be sure that um, there's plenty of time for people to ask questions and also for the panelists to ask questions of one another. Um, but perhaps to start, I, I was thinking about, um, uh, well, a little bit about the, I shared in the chat during my introduction a project that the Buell Center um, had worked on recently called Green Reconstruction, where part of it was looking at, um, or sort of one of the places it began was we uh, worked with a bunch of students here to put together a database of uh, all of the professional programs of the built environment that we could um, locate in the country. Um, so not just architecture uh, represented here, you know, at this conference, but also planning uh, various uh, preservation programs, um, real estate development, anything we could find in schools of the built environment or in schools that maybe weren't of the built environment, but that had programs related to the built environment. Point being, we ended up with um, over 1,000, 1,100 programs, I think, that this had a staggering sort of, that were located in uh, all over the country, obviously, and, all, and the, the range of the types of institutions was just really striking thinking about the different contexts for these programs um, uh, that were obviously going to be informing really different um, approaches to curricula and syllabi and um, ways of teaching about the built environment. And I was just thinking about that during um, everyone's presentations because part of our um, uh, you know, criteria for uh, the prizes uh, here represented here is um, some kind of institutional innovation or thinking about um, uh, hoping to recognize a course proposals that <clears throat> don't just um, innovate in terms of the content of the courses, but also in terms of the sort of what the course is doing in its institutional context, how it works. Um, that could relate to, you know, perhaps intervening in, in a required uh, track um, or, I mean, there are various modes of collaboration across, um, you know, between course types, for example, that are represented here. Um, but another, another thing that is represented here with two of the groups, but also has happened in prior iterations of the prize, is cross-institutional collaboration. So uh, working between not just programs within schools, but from school to school. Um, and I'm, I'm just thinking about back to the Green Reconstruction Project, one of our, we were just really inspired by the sort of collective power represented by this group of institutions and programs, but we're also struck by uh, how infrequent it felt to us, at least, that there was any actual feeling of um, coll the collectivity in said power. In other words, people, um, for reasons that are understandable, but these institutions and programs often tended to work sort of uh, on their own. And um, when we're thinking about the scale of the challenges we face, not just climate, but also, you know, everything that sort of climate justice represents um, that we've talked about in these, uh, or that you've talked about in your course proposals, to think about the scale of those challenges calls for, you know, a scale of intervention that is necessarily bigger than one institution or one course. So I was just hoping to maybe talk a little bit about the the what it has meant maybe specifically for the for the two courses represented here that are working across institutions but also the the same spirit exists i think within each of the other course proposals of um, trying to sort of break down disciplinary walls or perhaps typological ones <laughs> related to um, the course courses um, with institutions um, uh, and and learn about the challenges of setting that up also the possible benefits and I'm and specifically maybe I know it's um, largely yet to come, so it'll be speculative. But I'm wondering what what benefits you might imagine uh, for the students who are involved in these, especially the cross uh, institutional collaborations, 
um, uh, to learn in this kind of new uh, or seemingly new, unusual um, uh, context. So uh, I don't know if either one of the uh, teams representing those cross-institutional collaborations wants to speak to to that. Perhaps it's something that's been going on, you know, uh, outside of this project for a while. You could speak to sort of how it's been working or how you anticipate it working coming up. Should I go first? Go for it, yeah. Okay, um, so Andreas and I um, uh, work, and, and our third colleague who could not be here today, um, we work in different institutions and we work in different disciplines. So Andreas and Young are uh, in a school of architecture and I'm in a department of geography and planning, uh, primarily geography, and we have a couple of planning faculty. Um, and Andreas and I have worked together for some years um, and I should say that we, we are both uh, um, universities, Bowling Green and Toledo in Northwest Ohio. And there's a little bit of competition. We're fighting over the same pool of students. So structurally, there's not a lot of incentive to work together um, because we, uh, there is tension. I, I, I think I can say that <laughs> uh, without hesitation between the two institutions. But we have been working under the radar. So in some senses, um, it is not as trans our work is not as transformative as it could be, uh, because we, we are sort of working at our level, but we're not able to get the two institutions to work together. Um, so, so that's an issue. Um, the other also is that, and we written a little bit about this, uh, bringing students, you were asking Jacob about the impact on students. We have students from two different disciplines, um, two different ways of working. Um, having been trained as an architect, I know how studios work, how you can be uh, so consumed by a project for days on end. But then the planning students are coming to the studio to discuss their project and the architecture students are thinking about something else and have no time for this today. You know, they can talk about this day after tomorrow, but not today. And so that frustrates the planning students. And the architecture students are frustrated because the planning students have no imagination <laughs> talking about what is possible and not wanting to think big. So there are a lot of challenges in doing this, but we have had students come back to us many years later um, and tell us that despite the frustrations of a project like this, of a course like this, um, it has been one of the most rewarding courses that they took when they were in school because they learned how to work in a cross. They, they, so we put them in teams. So it's not just each of the groups, each of the universities working on their own, but every student is working with a student from another discipline. Um, and so I think that they've always said has been good training uh, for later, um, as difficult as it was when they were in it. Amazing, how, how, how do things compare maybe in Colorado and Wisconsin? Yeah, I can uh, chime in. Um, so yeah, so Sarah and I are working together between uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee and the uh, University of Colorado in Denver. Um, for some context, Sarah and I met together first in Milwaukee. We were both uh, uh, architectural fellows there uh, last academic year. Um, and then we formed a long distance relationship. Um, and I think, I think for both of us, you know, working at large or relatively large um, public state schools, like, you know, in, in, at UWM, most students are from Wisconsin and at CU Denver, most students are from Colorado. And that tends to be the case at comparable universities. So there's kind of like a real siloed uh, body of knowledge of like, you know, students from Wisconsin, meeting students from Wisconsin. And so I think we're, we were really trying to take advantage of this kind of change in uh, geography. And I think for the, you know, for the dollar store uh, proposal, it's really advantageous because it's such, it's a kind of, you know, the map 
is a the kind of rapidly spreading map. It really covers the whole country. And so when we looked at the two institutions, they kind of are nicely pinpointed and dividing the country in thirds so that we can kind of use them as two hubs and uh, branch out from there. Um, and yeah, I think for the students, it, yeah, it, it the siloed knowledge, uh, I think it just presents with them a really, uh, I think, unique opportunity uh, to kind of build their networks with their peers, not just from their home institution. Um, we all know how kind of small the field of architecture is. And I think, you know, it's, it can be hard to, uh, even so it is kind of geographically separated. So I think students, uh, you know, at least we're teaching the kind of preliminary seminar or just concluded this week, but um, there's a real excitement to kind of talk to students at other schools and find out what they're up to. And in the same way that it's really exciting for us to hear what's what's up or what's upcoming at, at your institutions, I think the students have a kind of uh, desire for that, maybe in particular after such a kind of isolated couple years. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's, we haven't done, it was a, in contrast, this, is, this will be our first time running this inter-institutional course so fingers crossed and we'll, we'll it's kind of experiment so we'll see what happens i don't know if um sarah anybody in the on the other team has anything to add to what was what was said i'm i'm struck by when you said we all know um the architecture is small as i think how you said it which is definitely a feeling um that i think um i think i know what you mean but we were also struck by there are so many ways that architecture institutionally you know, is not small at all, um, but it takes real work to sort of open those channels um, and 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 through said opening, you know, empower ourselves and and students to kind of take advantage of the potential openings there. Um, I don't mean to cut off. Yeah, if there are any other uh, contributions from some of those other institutional collaborators. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add. Um, and I really appreciate Lindsay sharing some, sharing some context on how our partnership formed, but and we've always been interested as well in the conversation around contingent labour in architecture, in particular fellows or visiting assistant professorships and how, you know, how that, um, that transience has been amplified over the last couple of years and, you know, what it means to, to be a fellow, um, you know, in this moment where we're testing the peripatetic dimensions of COVID era education. So inherently, we're all operating at a distance to some degree with the students or with our students or our collaborators. So it was just using that to and inculcating it in a granular level through the courses that we were designing. So it's more just, you know, it's a transference of our experience into the classroom to try and see what kind of reciprocities, what kind of, um, you know, new forms of collaboration can emerge uh, as a consequence of, you know, our positions in the last couple of years. Great, thanks. Let's see. I see we um, have a couple questions that have popped up in the the Q and A. Um, I'll begin with um, one by Jonathan Bean. He says, "As observed by several of the presenters, architecture has long been an instrument of power and distinction. How do we work as a field? Uh, as a field, avoid uh, we as a field. Sorry, how do we as a field avoid reinventing the wheel?" when we collaborate with other fields, such as urban planning, many of which have long been working on or founded on equity. So it's a, it's a, I think a lot of the courses here and also in previous winners, sort of in a similar spirit, but perhaps within the institutions they're in, but have really emphasized uh, cross or interdisciplinary uh, work as part of the, the sort of um, contribution of the course. So um, uh, yeah, how do you sort of, as, as he said, avoid reinventing the wheel when you're making those bridges between disciplines, uh, but, but contending with um, the challenge there in Toledo that you know, students come with very different um, backgrounds, understandings from their own fields. Uh, so how do you sort of make the most of that without, um, uh, yeah, reinventing the wheel as, as Jonathan said. I don't, anybody could take that on perhaps uh, somebody at the CCA who's working across uh, well these types or uh, there's planning also represented elsewhere so if anybody wants to jump in um 
I'm with having three people, we all have to decide who speaks first. <laughs> um, I guess I'll try. Um, I guess in ref reference to Jonathan's question, um, I do think like some disciplinary boundaries can be useful. So for example, the property studio that I've been teaching definitely dabbles in like legal thinking around um, property. And I think we try as much as we can to just understand that our role is to kind of spatialize property. So if we understand that the key element of spatialization as our tech, as, as our expertise, then you know, we attempt then sort of recognize that we're not trying to sort of be lawyers, um, but we just want to kind of build on that knowledge. Um, also, if I could, I, maybe just to build on your last question, Jacob, because I think it's really interesting what you said about making this database of different institutions and realizing that architecture is more diverse than we realize. And um, your, your question prompted for me this recent realization that I've had that a lot of our students at CCA, um, especially ones who are the first in their families to go to college, um, often get attracted to architecture because their parents might be builders or contractors. And um, it's been, I think, and it's in, 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 in my studio, I've realized that that has a lot to do with questions of ownership too, because you know my students bring forward these questions about how um, community members can have a stake in kind of constructing their environments in this kind of complex economy, right? It's like who, who has money to build, who has land to build on. And um, I'm realizing too that um, I think we as an architecture school need to understand like how we link to those forms of practice that our students have extraordinary expertise in. Um, like they've been working for their, you know, as contractors for years themselves. So I, I'm really interested in what you're saying. I think it would might be fun to build on that more. Um, Brendan and James, do you want to pick up on anything? I also see, maybe I'll jump into, I, the second question by Peter Robb is also addressed to Brendan and James, so maybe I'll throw it into the mix here. Um, he says, very exciting to see how the larger issues of climate change addressed in various institutions, um, but interested to hear more from Brendan and James. How has the discussion broadening across several courses within the curriculum at CCA uh, impacted the college as a whole? Um, well, thanks for the question, Peter. And this actually relates to Jacob's first question about um, ways of collaborating in across the institution, because um, what we're trying to do in this set of classes that I think is unique is to take these different streams, studio, building technology, and history theory that are usually siloed as separate seminars or standalone courses and to try to bring them together. But we are fighting a kind of institutional structure that sort of requires us to be able to offer these courses in isolation as well. So each class is what we're trying to do is to find uh, ways of collaborating with each other and working independently so that a student who is maybe not taking Jeanette's studio or James's uh, uh, history theory class, but is taking my technology seminar can still benefit from it without necessarily having all of the context from those other classes. So um, in doing that, we're trying to be very aware of each other's curricula and ways of overlapping and reinforcing, but also ways of making it standalone. And I think this potentially has a lot of impacts uh, to the college as a whole, um, although you know, we haven't talked to classes yet, so <laughs> we're gonna have to, uh, I, I don't wanna make any misrepresentations, but to me, it's very exciting to um, think about the potential for classes like these where we're referencing um, fields and areas of knowledge that are beyond ourselves. And this kind of, in my mind, uh, goes back to Jake, Jacob's question um, because, uh, or actually maybe Jonathan's question too about expertise. Uh, because I think that in architecture, we as a discipline have a kind of mixed history of trying to um, espouse expertise that we don't have. Um, and I think a really valuable and underrated uh, role of architecture is to be generalists and to understand where we are not experts and can rely on experts and collaborate well with experts. And so this series of seminars and classes is really meant to develop particular expertise and also to show students that they don't have to be an expert in everything 
that they can rely on on experts uh, if they understand how to collaborate better with them. And you know, if I could just add to that, because I love these questions. Oh, Jeanette, my cat's also visiting. Um, <clears throat> Daniel Barber recently observed that all of the sort of increases in energy efficiency happening in buildings right now are actually being offset by the fact that we just have more square feet per person. And I think that that's a really interesting reminder that when you start looking at any of these problems through specific disciplinary frameworks, then you kind of miss kind of bigger um, uh, kind of conjunctions that are happening. And so I think that's one of the, the potencies of trying to work across fields like this. For me, it was thrilling to show up at an institution where I realized that in the building technology class, they're reading Jiahui Chang and they're reading Daniel Barber and they're reading the folks that I'm reading too. So that's um, super great. I think for me, one of the sort of ambitions of this actually would be to see whether um, the ideas that we're sort of dealing with in this kind of advanced set of classes might really work backward into the, the core uh, courses. Like I also teach history one, 1400 to 1850. And so the question of like, can we decarbonize the canon? Like, are there ways to sort of ask um, or to sort of seed these conversations from the absolute earliest uh, moments in, in uh, the sequence rather than sort of saving it for kind of advanced level work? I think that's a really important question that I, I hope we'll grapple with even more um, uh, at the CCA. It, it relates, I, yeah. Um, I, sorry. I'll go for it. I was just gonna, um, I just wanted to put a quick word about the idea of the sort of um, cross-disciplinary project because so with my studio um, and seminar, you know, of course we were engaged with the, the kind of discipline of, of geology and it's sort of different forms. And I think to me, what I also think is a really important kind of, or a really useful aspect of the sort of cross-disciplinary pollination pollution is is not just in the kind of potential for collaborations in courses or teaching, but actually the usefulness of um, bringing in other disciplines um, as, a, as a kind of new way to look at the world. And so um, for instance, in the sort of idea of, of geology, it produces a, a completely different time scale, like a, a much sort of a deeper time, a, a planetary time. And I think that those, um, it, it, for architects, it's especially important to understand that um, especially kind of um, architectural students that that kind of issue of, of time, um, th that kind of the time scale of the planet actually offers a, a different way of operating on the world or working on the world um, that is sort of essential to, uh, to issues of climate change. And so I think that it's not, I think it's not just about kind of experts or collaborations, but it's also a kind of uh, it's about different points of views and different frames of reference that um, kind of offer sort of an essential set of tools um, and instruments uh, to kind of working on these these issues. So I think that that's also kind of an important thing to say is that sometimes it's important to like sort of get out of the architectural box and and think through different conception of time, of space, of, of materials, right, uh, as a way to kind of to, to look at issues of the environment. I, I think that's a really... I'm glad you put it that way because it's kind of a bridge to this to the question uh, from Brian Holland that I think I was going to pose it to both you and Naya because I think very possibly they're very different answers or at least um, well anyway so the question is exciting work I'm interested in your conversations with students about the architect's agency in relation to the issues addressed here climate change and society if those conversations have happened what are students thinking about or if not how might you plan to approach this topic of agency so for uh, for you, Brittany, I think you were just addressing it like kind of an outside in approach. If we bring these other tools to bear, we can start to see um, perhaps new and exciting, at least for the students, ways of thinking about what architecture can be and do uh, uh, in relation to some of these issues. For you, Nea, I was thinking about your course because my understanding is that you, um, you're meeting people much earlier in their, in their uh, you know, architecture journeys. Um, and I would imagine there's a version of this conversation that's really important uh, as a kind of first impression for how to tackle some of these issues or, or what an architect um, is able to do relative to some of these problems that feel so vast. Um, I don't know, or, but, but uh, I'm curious how you might answer that question relative to the students um, that you're teaching. Um, thank you for the question. I was gonna anyhow gonna answer that without the question. 
So I teach at Howard University. It is a 95% completely. It's a black institute. We have black people. It gives, it's the Mecca for diverse population. So they come with a different perspective of environmental justice when they come. Activism is a part of them. So two questions, I, mean, I wanted to also address uh, Jonathan's question with this also is, one of the questions is, why are we doing this proposal? Because I do think what we think of justice today is different from justice, which was lit written in urban planning books, because it is a matter of time, space and people. And I do think that there is systemic injustice, but it is also a part of, we're creating history today. So I think as an architect, we, have that diverse population which is addressing. And all of us are dealing with wonderful students who are a different way of thinking, which so connected that they are actually, the climate justice comes from it, Howard, from, I'm sure from most of the institution is from the student up. It's not a top-down approach. Most of the students are bringing it to the class discussion. So to me, it's more for me to listen and also give them tools to become leaders in sustainability as they go as to be a minority leader, as they grow to be architects and licensed advisors. I'll leave my other colleague to answer a few more because we have very little time left, but I'll be happy to chat about this with anybody who few. I think we have a lounge. <laughs> That's what I was told. <laughs> I do believe there's a yeah, table or a lounge that we anybody can jump to if they like to keep this conversation going after the we have a, just a few more minutes. I don't know if anybody, I mean, I, I would imagine everyone here has thoughts. I know there's a version of this conversation that's sort of always churning in schools of architecture um, and rightly so. Um, but I also wanna make sure that uh, you all explicitly have space to ask questions of one another if you have them, um, being as you all are at the precipice of getting these new things going. So um, I wanna be sure that, uh, yeah, if you wanna ask each other anything, you have the space and anybody else in the audience, you know, there's probably time for one more. So, um, but maybe on the agency question, if anybody's had striking experiences um, uh, in relative to Brian's question. I just say real fast at, um... Speaking from our experience at CCA, the students are incredibly tuned in to their own agency and using architecture as an instrument for change. It's one of the things that I've enjoyed so much about teaching is that it doesn't take a lot of convincing to uh, talk to students about what the possibilities are. Um, it's more in kind of um, how can, what are the, the methods or tools or skills that students can use for change uh, and sort of finding causes or ideas or things that need improvement is, is not the issue at all, uh, which is wonderful. And um, I, I don't, I'm, I feel lucky at our institution. I'd be really curious uh, how other people uh, feel uh, their students react to kind of provocations like this. Just one very quick comment too. I think one thing that I found pretty startling but fascinating has been uh, the response from students and then people who have been involved in the project in a peripheral way, whether it's they've provided us with uh, retail space to have exhibitions or conversations. But it has, uh, you know, what's emerged is that a lot of them have been drawing categorical distinctions between the agency that architecture has versus. Um, the corporation versus like the academic institution and you know the consensus that's forming is one in which architecture doesn't actually have a lot of agency but it's the corporation itself so thinking about how architecture is intertwined with different layers and of bureaucracy and how they, they could be leveraged or subverted um, so there is some kind of understanding about what the limitations of architecture actually is has uh, been quite surprising That's great. I, I, um, I do think we can jump to the lounge, but I want to before the for anybody that would like to. Um, but before we formally end, I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone again for joining for all the work that's gone into these things and for uh, and to say congratulations, because I think <clears throat> it's really commendable work. And um, we'll look forward to uh, 
you know, figuring out in the years to come how to hopefully keep the conversation rolling as these courses are um, implemented and redesigned and you know everybody uh, is, is learning from each other uh, as they as they move ahead so hopefully it's the beginning uh, and certainly not the end of the conversation but really appreciate everyone joining um, both here on the panel and in the audience and uh, yeah I'll be happy to jump over to the lounge if anybody wants to keep chatting but otherwise um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day thank you thank you Thank you.